everyone. It's uh, 12.01, so I think we'll get started here. Hi, everyone. I'm Jason Key at SB Grid in Boston in Massachusetts. Uh, today, uh, we are lucky to have uh, Navarsh Panu joining us from Leiden University in uh, the Netherlands. So uh, today, Raj is going to tell us about automated macromolecular structure solution for weak SAD data with Crank2, which also, I think, appeared as a uh, nature communication a while back. So Raj, if you're there, go ahead. Hi, um, thank you very much for the introduction. It's uh, great to be here. So indeed, I'll be talking about um, macromolecular structure solution from SAD data and uh, as well published in uh, nature communications. And I have the reference uh, at the end of the slide. So this work was done by Pavel Skubak, who's my colleague here at Leiden University. And what I'll try to convince you today is that um, the steps that we use in experimental phasing to solve a structure are more than the sum of the parts. And if we can combine them efficiently, we can push the limits of substructure solution. So basically, what we are aiming at is when we have low resolution or weak anomalous uh, signal from a SAD data set. So as you know that um, when you have a strong anomalous signal and good resolution, usually a structure can be built automatically to a high degree. But if you don't have high resolution data or if you have a weak anomalous signal, things can be very uh, difficult. So what can we do in the case of if you have weak data? So that is either or both a weak anomalous signal or low resolution. So we were tackling this problem and then we were thinking about how is structure solution done traditionally? Well, it can be divided into distinct steps. First, we have to determine the substructure. From that, we can get initial phases. And then we know that macromolecular crystals contain regions of solvent, disordered regions, and regions of your macromolecule. So we can use density modification to improve our initial electron density map. And then we put that into automated model building with iterative refinement, and we try to build the best solution. But what we propose is that if we combine these steps, we can actually improve the process. So I think it's best to show this not mathematically, of course, the mathematics are detailed in the papers that I show in the reference, but just showing the ideas uh, using flowcharts. So right now, we'll assume that we have experimental data and we have a fairly correct anomalous substructure. And then what we do is we go to experimental phasing. Then traditionally, from experimental phasing, we get our best phases and we get a measure of how good or accurate these phases are. And that's in the form of a phase probability distribution or alternatively, we can call them Hendricks and Lapman coefficients. Then of course, we go into density modification and we need to combine with our experimental phases and we get a set of new phases and phase probabilities, which we can stick into model building and refinement, and then we try to get uh, our best model. Um, okay, so what do I mean by phase probabilities? Uh, this is a phase probability distribution that uh, Hendrickson and Lapman first introduced in 1970. It's a very convenient way of representing phase information, and it can also represent bimodal phase um, information. So with these four coefficients, we can um, essentially plot in one dimension the probability of our phases. So we see, uh, of course, on a the peaks indicating the most likely phases and of course um, the, uh, the distribution. But we have to rely on programs to estimate these coefficients, but this contains a great deal of information. So what I want to ask you or have you think about is this even better than the real thing? So wouldn't it be better to use our data 
directly and our substructure model and any model that we have built that thus far in the structure solution process rather than approximating all this information with four coefficients. So that's what we had done. Um, before I talk about um, how we um, combined information and use data directly, I wanted to first um, remind you of density modification. So we know that our protein or macromolecular crystals contain distinct regions of uh, protein and maybe multiple copies, which we can use, and disordered solvent. And if we flatten or flip the solvent, we can improve the electron density. But experience has shown that we need to combine this information with our experimental data, or traditionally with phase probability distributions. And that is basically the crux of a problem, or the main issue in density modification. How do we combine this efficiently and uh, to get the best possible phases? So I show you a diagram. Um, in blue, we see real space. And in what I've shown in um, orange is um, reciprocal space. And these two um, pictures, our are, are slides, are from Kevin Calton. <clears throat> so we start with an amplitude and a phase. We do a Fourier transform. We get our electron density. Now we modify our electron density based on knowledge of um, protein crystals or whether we have multiple models in our crystal, and we get a modified electron density. Now we have to back transform it, and we get a modified amplitude and phase. The problem is here, how do we get the next phase in the iteration by combining the experimental phase, the phases that we got experimentally with the density modified phase? What is done typically is actually just to multiply them and to assume independence. But you know, this isn't, it isn't independent because the phases, the experimental phases are, the modified phases are derived from the experimental phase information. So that is, um, that is a problem. If we can get around this, maybe we can actually get better phase information. So why can't we use the experimental data and anomalous substructure directly? rather than assuming independence of phases and relying on hendrickson lattman coefficients. But to do this, we need multivariate distributions at each step that take into account correlations between the model and all the data. So that's what we had done. This is actually our first implementation in uh, Crank 1, where, again, starting with the anomalous substructure and experimental data, we go into experimental phasing, we get phases, but then what we do is we put the experimental data and anomalous substructure into density modification, and we don't assume um, independence, and we use a multivariate distribution in phase combination to optimally um, get the best phase information, and we pass that into um, model building and refinement, and again, you guys might have an experience with a sad likelihood function in RefMac. Well, that uses the uh, experimental data, so the F plus and the F minus directly, and the anomalous substructure, and any partial model that has been built, and you does that in model building and refinement. So we had found that this was much better than using Hendricks and Lapman coefficients for a sad experiment. But we thought that actually, the equations, we can combine experimental phasing, phase combination, and model refinement in one process. And that's what I show here. Again, we have, starting with our experimental data and anomalous substructure, we put that and we, we have a function here that if you just have anomalous substructure and um, you know your bifoot pairs, this is uh, the likelihood function that reduces to experimental phasing. You get your first electron density map, put that into density modification, or if it's good enough, put it into model refinement. We then get a model and we get modified phases. But now we have a likelihood function that takes into account 
density modified amplitudes and phases and information from a model and model refinement and combines it with the anomalous substructure and experimental um, data all in a multivariate function to get an even better electron density map. So we thought that this would be much um, better and can push the limits of refinement. But of course, we wanted to test it just, just to see how good it is or if it is uh, any good at all. So what we then set out to do was to take over 150 data sets from a wide range of um, resolution. Um, so anything from under one angstrom to um, this is a 3.88 angstrom data set. Uh, which I'll talk about um, as we go on, and a wide range of anomalous scatters, er, anything from selenium, most of the time it was selenium in these test cases, but also sulfur, chloride, iodide, bromide, calcium, zinc, and others. And we wanted to compare it with a stepwise multivariate approach, so that's in the current crank one, with uh, the combined approach that we've uh, done in uh, the crank two program. So what I show here are the results of um, our test cases. So of course, we implemented this um, package in RefMac, but we need to use a density modification and a model building program. For these test cases, we chose um, to use Parrot and Buccaneer, but we also have interfaces for ShellXE and um, ARP Warp as well. So what this slide shows is the fraction of the model that has been correctly built. On the x-axis is what current methods are crank one, or the stepwise multivariate function uses. So if, it, if the stepwise function was able to build things to a high degree, we see that the fraction is one. So here are all models, for example, that the um, current methods or the stepwise uh, multivariate approach built to a high degree. And here are, for example, cases where it couldn't build at all, not solved. What we have on the y-axis is the exact same thing, but this is using the combined algorithm that combines experimental phasing, density modification, and uh, model refinement all into one. So if it's at one, you see that it's built to a high degree. So again, here are about a third of the data sets where and all data sets are shown with a uh, blue circle. Here are data sets where both uh, targets or both algorithms were able to build to a very high degree. So over 80% uh, completion of the model. And these are about a third of all of our data sets. What we see here is another third where none of no method was able to solve. Basically, it was just a weak anomalous signal. So that's also about a third of data sets that we see here. So un, um, under 10% completion of, of the model. But we see also this third, the interesting bit, where over 80% is built with the combined algorithm, but um, you know under 60% is built with the current approach. So this showed us that you know there's a power in, in this method. So just to give you a summary, we see that with the new combined approach, we get an average um, increase from 60% to 74% with um, looking at all 150 data sets. But if we exclude data sets that were built to 85% uh, by the current approach, or where the substructure was not found, we see about a third of the data sets, 45 uh, data sets remain, where the average model, average fraction of the model built increased from 28% to almost 80%. So this is a this is a difference essentially between success and failure, which was um, very encouraging. So one test that we highlight is actually um, from collected and solved uh, by someone uh, at um, SB grid at the moment, I think, Pete Meyer. Uh, so he was looking at RNA polymerase 2, 12 subunit. This is a 3.88 angstrom data set, but it is actually anisotropic. And uh, he could probably tell you more about the data set, uh, but uh, uh, just summarizing it was um, the signal, the anomalous signal was from zinc. So 
the authors couldn't solve the structure with that data alone, but use a partial model. So the 10 subunit uh, RNA polymerase, multi-crystal MAD and manual uh, model building. But we found just from the signal uh, of zinc, so just using the zinc substructure, we could build to completion um, greater than 80% of C-alphas um, with the SAD data alone, automatically using this new combined algorithm to an R-free of um, under 38%. So what we've shown here, um, maybe it's not so clear, but uh, in, in colors is um, the model that was built by Crank2 uh, using Buccaneer. And you may be able to see in gray, but it's uh, quite well superimposed, the C-alpha trace for the true structure. And you see that it's built to quite, quite a high degree, the C-alpha positions, again, because it's only 3.88 angstrom data, we can't uh, get the sequence, but we get a C alpha trace, and, and this is what it, it looks like. So what I wanted to talk about next is um, something that was also um, always a concern for Pavel and I when we were looking at this. Um, we always thought, and some of you might have noticed as well, when you go in density modification, you will find that um, you always get maybe 0.8 for the figure of merit. So the figure of merit is very high, even if your final map is, uh, you know, lousy. And we thought, oh, you know, once we get over this assumption of independence that's being assumed in traditional density modification, maybe we can get actually realistic um, figure of merits. Unfortunately, this wasn't the case, and this bothered us. But one thing that's nice about using multivariate functions is you can introduce other parameters which you can accurately estimate and provide better error estimates to try to reduce bias. And this is something that Pavel has done and called, um, he named beta correction, which is applied to these errors that we use in maximum likelihood and refine in order to reduce bias of, mod of um, density modified data. And I, sh I show this graph here. And so, what I have on the um, y-axis is the figure of merit that's reported by density modification. And again, in blue dots are all of the models that we see. On the x-axis is the actual cosine of the phase error. So the figure of merit is trying to estimate the cosine of the phase error, but we're calculating the exact um, cosine of the phase error on the x-axis. And basically what you see, even if the cosine of the phase error is very bad, so this is a 90 degree phase error, density modification will still report you know, a 0.6 or 0.8 figure of merit. And um, you see basically a straight line. It's always between 0.6 or 0.8, no matter how bad your phases are. This is without applying this bias reduction using the SAT function that we had, um, had uh, implemented in RefMAC. But if you actually use this bias reduction and get accurate estimates, you can see that now there's actually a relation between, it, it's almost like a diagonal line between the figure of merit and the cosine for the phase error. So we are actually able to get accurate uh, estimates of the figure of merit, which is of course helpful in the subsequent model building process. If you get an accurate estimate of your phase error, you're able to get uh, an accurate map. Okay, so now to the final part of uh, my talk, I wanted to talk about using MRSAD and basically applying it in this combined algorithm. You may recall from the flowchart that I showed you, we can use information from a variety of sources and use it in this multivariate function, which takes into account phasing information, model information and your experimental data directly. So if you, when do you want to use MRSAD? If you have a molecular replacement solution, but you cannot obtain a complete model. So let's say that you're sure of your um, molecular replacement solution, but it's a partial model, or you know, your R free is, uh, R factor is around 50%. But you also, you can tell, and this is from data, uh, reduction, if you look at your CC anno, for example, that you have an anomalous signal. So this is greater than 30%. Then you can use this MRSAT within Crank2 in order to improve your model. And we found that this has been um, 
we've had some recent reports of some very nice results in this case, and I'll share one test case um, with you. But before I do that, one of the things that you want to consider is that your partial model may not contain all the anomalous scatterers, and you may need to find the rest with anomalous maps. And there's many programs to do this, and Crank2 does this automatically as well. Another thing that you might want to consider is that your partial MR model may be biased, and this may affect your ability to complete your model. In this case, what we suggest, and it's also a, an option available in Crank2, is to run two jobs. One, just using the substructure that you find that you can find with your partial model, and one actually inputting the partial model as well. But I'll talk more about that, how to do that, when we actually look at the Crank2 GUI. So the test case I wanted to show you, and again, another uh, data set from um, Harvard, from the Rappaport uh, lab, is a 4.5 angstrom data set with the anomalous signal from, um, so it was SEC-A, SEC-Y complex, ATPAs, and with a selenomet sec y um, protein. So the authors could not solve the structure with the SAD data alone, but used a partial MR uh, structure, two-fold NCS averaging, cross-crystal averaging, and manual model building. So this is, of course, a very low-resolution data. What we had done is um, we obtained the selenium positions from the partial MR solution, which was actually a very low resolution model. And just with these selenium positions, we put it into automated model building, and we found that we could get over 60% of the model being built correctly in an R free that was under 40%. Now in this case, uh, if we had actually put in the partial model and the selenium positions all together in the combined fit function, we got slightly worse results, but um, for this case, that I think the reason was that the partial MR model was from a very low resolution structure. So in this case, it was worth just to um, not take that into account and just use the selenium positions, which, you know, it shows actually the, the power of the method. And we've had um, at least um, uh, reports, uh, very recent structures, about seven, uh, anywhere from 3.5 to 4.2 angstroms, again, where people haven't been able to solve the structure from the SAD data, but using uh, a partial MR model, and now the results have been varied. Sometimes with a partial MR model, they were able to build it and then complete the substructure using the partial MR model, but sometimes just starting from the anomalous substructure alone, they were also able to build it, and they had led to, and it had led to a solution which uh, they could then complete with um, uh, manual model building. Again, when you're dealing with this low resolution data, it's usually the case where you do get just the C alpha position. So there is um, manual model building that would need to be done. So just now going into more practicalities of what to use. So crank one, again, is also used for SAD and MAD and also SIRS. But again, this implements the older stepwise multivariate function, which I had shown you in um, graphs, in, in the flowcharts, I should say. But crank two is uh, just available within last year. Um, and it also is available for SAD, can do SAD or MAD or SRS. But uh, for this combined multivariate function, which I showed you, it's for SAD, uh, it has been implemented and we should be getting SRS available within uh, the year using a combined approach. So we would suggest if you're running Crank2 to, to use, um, you can use it in with the traditional CCP4i GUI, but it's also available and much better supported in the i2, the new CCP4 i2 GUI available under CCP4 7.0. I should also mention um, that you can also run Crank2 via the CCP4 online web server. So I mentioned that in the abstract, but you can also just search CCP4 online and you can run Crank2 with that via a web server. 
So I've shown you a picture of the CCP4 I2, which is something that we recommend. So we ask, um, there's very few options that you have to do. So you can choose where you want to start the pipeline. So if you want to start at substructure detection, in which case it will run shell XD, and you can always end with uh, refinement, but you can end at any stage that you want. You can also start at any stage you want. You can also input a partial model. So this is this MRSAD that I was talking about. If you were to click on that, you would have the option of just using, um, finding the substructure and just using that to reduce bias, or you can um, include the um, partial model from the start. Um, you can input a sequence, or you can just, if you click that off, just put in the number of residues, and you have to specify the substructure atom and a guess of the number of sub substructures in the asymmetric unit. Finally, you can, um, you need to provide the reflection data, so the I plus or I minus or F plus and F minus. And um, something that's also quite convenient and what we also recommend is to put in unmerged files. So for example, if you have an unmerged XDS file, you can then see the CC anom, which can be useful to see how good uh, your anomalous substructure goes into. And if you have additional MAD data, you can click on that as well. Or a native uh, uh, data set, you, you can click on um, this button right here. So very, very few data needs to be filled in, and it gives a F prime and F double prime value. Uh, it fills that out for you, but you should, of course, always check to make sure that that's okay, because these are just tabulated values, and the ones that you get from, for example, the synchrotron would be more accurate. Although it requires very little input to get started, you can also have, um, if you click on the advanced options tag, you have a whole bunch of options you can select. So you can choose a high-resolution cutoff. You can increase choose to increase the number of trials or when it should be stopped. You can even put any shell XD or shell XC keyword that you want in this box right here. Those are usually the options that, for example, I change if I would need to rerun the program, or I would want to change the number of cycles of model building that I'd run. But in that case, you would just want to start, there's an option to choose what to run next, and you can just run crank2 again, and you could, using the model that was developed in the last run, you can input it in the next run within i2, which is quite convenient. Again, if you wanted to run things quickly and on the CCP4 web server, you could also choose to do CCP4 online. So, um, if you have problems, we very much like feedback, um, so you can always email Pavel and me, and we'll get back to you with advice, and this has happened um, uh, within the last, I think, six months uh, with the new release. Um, I can count uh, 10 people have emailed uh, us, and we have uh, have quite a good they, they weren't able to solve their structure, but we helped them solve the structure. And these were usually very low resolution structures. And, you know, that's all we always like to hear that. And it all also helps us to get um, feedback and how to improve the program. Of course, you know, we can't promise that we'll solve all structures if, if there's no anomalous signal. But, of course, we can help you with um, uh, evaluating the log files and seeing if there's any promising data or something to suggest. We've also tried very hard to have a help documentation available for Crank2. So basically, when you open up the Crank2 GUI, there's a help um, icon. You just click on that, and it has a, a lot of detail about the log files, what we think are important, what are good signs of when you have a good signal that is promising. Basically, we report something. Once you get to the model building stage, there's something that we report that's called R-COMB. So the R factor from the combined structure factor, if that's under 40%, that's usually a good sign that uh, things are um, solved or you should have a, a reasonable model. Of course, the lower it is, the better. Okay, so 
Um, the last two slides I wanted to show you all of the references that describe all of the mathematics. I like describing things with um, flowcharts. I find that people get bored if I show lots of equations, but if you're interested in the equations, they're all published um, over here uh, in all of these re references. Of course, uh, we had a lot of help from uh, many uh, people uh, providing data sets. We love to run things through many data sets. So the JCSG is useful, uh, speed check data, month advice, uh, Christoph Mueller Diekmann. Uh, we go to collect our data at the ESRF, and they're always very nice in providing us with data sets that are, have been very tough. And um, they, so for their serial beam line, now Crank 2 is run by default um, when there is a SAD data. So they're, they're very enthusiastic about it, and they, they provide uh, great feedback. So that, that's, um, it's a, a wonderful uh, arrangement that we have. Um, Garib Mershadov is the author of RefMac. He's uh, great for providing us with feedback and also changing things in RefMac so that we can implement these functions. Kevin Cowton is the author of Parrot and Buccaneer, who uh, also, which we use within Crank2 um, for, for model building and uh, density modification. George Sheldrick, we use Shell X C D uh, and E within Crank2, and he um, also provides uh, a lot of feedback. And actually, it, it, when you run uh, Shell X, C, D, and E in CCP4 I2, it actually runs Crank2. Uh, so we have uh, Shell X, C, D within Crank2 as um, separate programs. So um, we're always in contact with him because he always has great information about what we should present in our log files. Yeah. Victor Lamzen is the main author for ARPWARP, who you can also use the combined approach with ARPWARP as well. And finally, um, I show people who provide us uh, the, our funding agencies with money. So with that, I thank you for attending. And uh, um, please feel free to ask any questions. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, if anyone has questions, there's a couple ways you can ask them there. You can either chat them in the uh, chat window. There's a small icon, a uh, second icon in from the right at the bottom that you can use to send chat. There's also a menu in the far bottom corner that would allow you to raise your flag, and then I can unmute you if you're mic'd, and you can just ask your question uh, with your microphone. Questions here. So uh, one question I had. So it... ShellX seems to be this sort of, sort of preferred uh, application for um, the substructure determination. Uh, is is would you say that's right, or do you have do you jump back and forth? Do you use different ones, or do you, do you recommend just always sticking with uh, ShellX if you've got it? At the moment, uh, we would recommend ShellX C and D. Um, Pavel Skubak is actually working on another um, substructure detection program. So he's just about to complete it. And the nice thing about it is, is that it has a different concept than um, Shell X, C, and D. Uh, so we, um, whenever you have a different algorithm, it can be useful. So we use that typically in parallel. So we just try to find the best solution and run that. We also have, um, which actually we've implemented since 2007 in, in Crank, and that is um, using likelihood methods to try to verify uh, a substructure. So we have that as well. But um, at least in our experience, we found that um, if a substructure is found, it's found to a high degree of completion uh, within Shell X. D. Sometimes you might have to run it for more trials, but that's why we suggest you know to run at least a thousand trials. It it's it doesn't take that long, and it it can really be the difference between success and failure and getting a complete substructure. Now this is different for MR SAD, uh, but if you have a partial model, then you of course want to use anomalous um, anomalous maps as well in that case. So using um, phases from your partial model. Thanks. Yeah. We have a question here from the group. Hi, Rush. Uh, so great talk. One one question that I have is you mentioned the the MAD and CIRAS framework that's either incoming soon or there already. I'm 
I'm curious if that's flexible enough that a multi-crystal experiment could be fitted into the likelihood function without too, too great a degree of imprecision or, or poor approximations. So that's uh, it's an excellent question. That's what we're working on at the moment. So we're going in steps. So we have an SRS function, and that's what we're testing at the moment. Um, it, it works well for phasing, and it um, works well for density modification. But now what we found, when we use this combined approach, we're, we're still working on it, and we need to have more data sets. But sometimes you have a degree of non-isomorphism, and that leads to problems with um, when you combine information. So we need to develop, in, in the case when you have non-isomorphism, we need to develop either more sophisticated um, models of non-isomorphism and modeling that error, or um, it might be in that case beneficial actually to turn back to this hendrickson lapman coefficient and imposing phase information in that way in a multivariate function that also can include um, your experimental data. But so it works for SIRS and now we're working this case of MAD and also with multi-crystal. It's, it's basically on our to-do list. Um, so I'm hoping um, within the next year we can do the MAD and then also with um, yeah, this whole idea of when to combine multiple uh, data sets. A lot of people are working on this uh, problem at the moment, and I have actually seen some rather nice results of when you combine it, you know, for example, at the beginning and then put in a merged file. But actually what I'm more interested in is when you can't merge them and using these differences in order to phase. But that's something more for the future, I'm afraid. I, I can't really say anything about that at the moment because we're, it, it it's becomes mathematically more complex the more data sets that you have. Great. Okay. All right, well, with that, uh, thank you again for a great talk. And um, uh, I think I'll follow up with you again uh, later offline. Uh, okay. Everyone else, thank you for joining, and uh, have a good day. Okay, thank you. Bye.